Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to another episode of Let Us Reason. This one, of course, is a very special episode since we have a special guest with us. Uh, I kept the name of the guest a surprise, and I didn't want to reveal a whole lot of information, but I gave you hints that it will be a testimony of someone who is now an ex-Muslim, a follower of Jesus, but prior to that was a follower of Islam, our dear sister Khadija. Sister Khadija, we are honored to have you in our show. Thank you, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're honored that you accepted our invitation. Uh, you know, we understand the risk uh, that just by virtue of being an ex-Muslim anyway, uh, that you might be going through. But I always have a high respect for female Muslims who make such a leap and follow Christ because I, I know the cost is, is heavy and can impact sometimes far beyond just normal relationships, especially if the person has other connections, have marriages, have children, and it can get complicated. But I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Uh, we would like for you, of course, to walk us through a journey of your transformation from being a follower of Islam all the way until you became a follower of Jesus. And then we'll look at some questions and we'll interact based on some of the facts that you've shared already. You are free to share whatever you feel comfortable with. We are not here to try to in any way to jeopardize your safety by any stretch of an imagination. So please uh, don't feel pressured uh, to share anything that you may perceive uh, to be a little bit uh, you know, outside of the realm of safety that you would like to maintain. All right, well, with that says, thank you again for joining us. Please start by telling us, of course, a little bit about your background and your upbringing and walk us through that journey. And in, a, in between, I may interrupt you uh, slightly. Okay, no problem. Okay, so my name's uh, Khadija. I was born and raised in Yorkshire uh, in the UK. Um, I grew up in a family where I wasn't necessarily raised to pray five times a day or learn Arabic or go to mosque, which is quite... It's not normal, really, for a Muslim family um, because I actually grew up in a Quranist family. Um, now, although I grew up in a Quranist family, I was still sort of compounded, compounded by many of the rules and regulations that Islam taught, like eating halal meat, fasting, and believing in the Prophet Muhammad. So I don't know if you know what a Quranist uh, sort of background looks like, but my family only sort of looked at the Quran as their main compass for uh, directing their lives. They didn't look at the hadith nor the traditions. Um, they believe that Muhammad, they, you know, they believe that Muhammad was a prophet and the final messenger and the seal of the prophets, but they didn't really take it much further than that. So as I was growing up, I really didn't know what was within the hadith, and I really didn't know about the character of Muhammad. So as I began to mature, I became fascinated by Islam. <clears throat> I began questioning um, those that that were sort of believing in the hadith, and I went so far as sort of writing letters to scholars and, and researching and disqualifying um, a lot of the hadith and and and, and really trying to, to find out why did Muslims need a secondary book when the Quran always said that it was perfectly, uh, perfectly complete and fully detailed and explained. Um, and my father always taught me that knowledge was power and you know you should always question things which again is very um, it's very strange really for a Muslim father to say that to their child because in Islam really you shouldn't be questioning you should just obey and um, so as I started college I prepared myself to look into other faiths such as Christianity and Judaism but really they didn't interest me um, I was actually convinced like many of the other Muslims that I was born into the true religion and furthermore I think I was put in a position where I felt like I had the right strain of Islam as well the other the other strains were wrong I was actually born into the right strain of Islam Islam. So my battle wasn't really to convince um, other people from other religions to, to, to come into Islam. My, I felt my battle was really to convince other Muslims that the Quran only approach was the right approach. And it was obvious to me that Allah was a true God. And I had a, not only just a spiritual affinity to Islam, but I felt it was a right religion because it was followed by the people that I looked to, to the most, which were my family. So by the time I reached university, I was well on my way to understanding Islam. I devoured books, I'd questioned the unquestionable, you know, I was writing to scholars, and it was time for me to really sort of submit myself to God. I was still a student, I was thirsty to learn, and I was, like I said, I was always encouraged by my father to ask questions, because through questions came answers and knowledge. Every time I sort of looked and looked for answers and devoured books and, and tried, to, tried to seek answers, I found that although these books and answers were fascinating for my young mind, 
I also had an air of dubiousness. The sources that, that were quoted always seemed unreliable. There was lots of statements that were unfounded. And even the historical evidence that was backing up the Quran was only backed up by the Quran. There was no external historical evidence. And this sort of left me feeling quite uncomfortable in my heart. But I didn't sort of question it any further. I just sort of lived with that uncomfortability. So as I was going through sort of the process of evaluating all of these claims and trying to get closer to, to Allah, I was sidetracked by marriage. Um, so I was married at, the, I married at the age of 19 against the wishes of my family, which is quite bizarre. Um, it wasn't an arranged marriage. It was, I was married to a, a Western traditional Muslim man, also from England. And I say Western traditional because he was born, raised and educated here in this country. But he chose to be modern when it suited him and traditional when he wanted to enforce his authority over me. And it was a really bizarre um, way to live your life because he wanted to have a modern wife uh -huh. when he felt like it. But then at the same time, he constantly wanted to show his authority over me by telling me that, you know, I was his subordinate. He was, um, you know, he, he, he had um, control over me. You know, I wasn't allowed to leave the house without his permission. Um, if I was to leave the house, I had to have a, a chaperone go with me. So there was lots of things that were, they were, they were odd. They, you know, they didn't marry one another. So which ethnicity, which ethnicity, uh, ethnicity was he from? Was he like from the Middle East or was he just uh, from the West and converted to Islam? No, he was a Pakistani. He was actually yeah. Pakistani. Okay. Um, so I, I, I learned how to pray now. I, I obviously didn't know how to pray when I was living under my father's household. But now that I was married, I had to learn how to pray. And I was pushed into sort of the backward dogmas associated with Islam through the bullying and subjugation. I was studying second year law. And due to the cultural pressures, um, I was forced to leave the world of academia and put my apron on instead. I, I certainly was not an equal in my life. And I was told that a, a woman's role was to serve her husband and through pleasing him, I would please Allah and enter heaven. And, you know, there is, I believe there is a hadith that actually says no woman has fulfilled her obligation to her Lord and she, until she has fulfilled her obligation to her husband. Oh, absolutely. So, so I quickly resigned to being a doting wife and I stopped questioning Islam because it just seemed to cause marital discourse and family feuds with my backward in-laws and my husband. And I ended up just taking on many of the traditions of Islam. Um, because I felt as though I had no voice and I had nowhere to turn to because everywhere that I turned, I was being told the same things that I was that I was being told by my in-laws and my husband. Um, and my family didn't want to know me anymore because obviously I'd married without their wishes. So they'd kind of turned their back on me anyway. Wow. Even though you married a Muslim man. Absolutely. Even though I married a Muslim man, uh, they turned their back on me because they really did feel that I was making a mistake. And to be fair, I should have probably listened to them. But I know Christ was working in my life. So whatever happened with my husband, this was all Christ working in my life and bring, drawing me closer to him. So my husband was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis um, a year into my marriage. So I spent my time looking after him, not because I loved him, but because I loved Allah and I believe through my good deeds. I would gain his pleasure and gain heaven because, as you know, Islam is all about works. So my husband was unbelievably unloving and unkind. He was cold. He never reciprocated the high esteem that I held him in. Him in. in fact, he, he reveled in controlling me through the Islamic culture that he'd inherited. And I say inherited because 99% of Muslims are born into the religion blindly. They're born into that religion and that's the religion of their forefathers and they will keep that going. Um, so I was absolutely undeserving of his love and I was undeserving of being looked after. And by his words, I was unlovable. And these words would really echo in my mind and gave me more and more vigor to prove to him that I was kind, generous, loving person. And I now realize that that was just a ploy for him to rob me of my good nature and to control me. And no matter how much I turned to the Quran for comfort and respite, I would only find things that would confirm his treatment of me. Women, unfortunately, are not equals in Islam. They really are the property of their husbands. And each time I retaliated and questioned his treatment, the reply was, well, I can marry four times if you don't listen to me and you will be in the hellfire like the majority of women. Um, you know, there, there are verses that we can go into that, that, that explain why he said this uh, and why he actually felt this and why I believed it as well, because this is in the Islamic scriptures.
So he, he raped me um, many times, but he justified it because in the Quran, it says in Surah 2, 223, your wives are places of sowing, of sowing seeds for you to so come to your place of cultiv uh, cultivation however you wish. You know, women are chattel belonging to their husbands, not to be loved, but to be used. Um, you know, I think there's something in the, one of the hadiths that if, where it says that if he called you to his bed and if she refuses, the angels will curse her into the, into the morning. You know, which woman wants to have, be cursed by angels? But if the Islamic scriptures are saying that, as a Muslim woman, the only thing that you know is those Islamic scriptures and your community is telling you the same thing, then you're going to believe that. Um, so I was financially controlled. I had little contact with my own family and friends, and my life was literally to serve and obey my husband. And that's exactly what it, what Allah prescribes for women once they're married. And I was sickened by all of this, but I was I was too afraid to admit how wrong it was because of the aftermath and the chastisement within the Islamic faith, the extended family, and the community. I was reaching out to Allah for help. It never came. You know, I would talk to Allah the same as I as I talk to Jesus now, I suppose. But nothing ever came back. My words were spoke, being spoken void. And I didn't love me. He left me because my abuser had etched into my heart and mind that I was ugly, unworthy, and most of all, oh, wow. unlovable. And that was etched in my mind. And I think this is so important for us to understand that the emotional carnage that Islam causes to women is, is almost beyond repair. Only Christ can repair that. And I think this is something that we, 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 you're going to see as my testimony evolves. You know, I, I ashamedly came to a point in my life where I could see no way out of this Groundhog Day hell. You know, either I had to kill him or I had to take my own life. It was I was deeply, deeply sad and angry at my pathetic self for allowing myself and my kindness to be abused. But most of all, I was ashamed of, of, of thinking that, you know, this was an okay way to live just because my culture and my religion told me it was okay inside there was something in, in me that that told me it was wrong but I, I ignored that voice and I suppressed it but I knew something had to change there came a point where I realized something had to change and and I looked at my innocent children um I had three young children and they gave me hope and a courage which helped me leave my Islamic husband after 12 years of, of emotional and physical abuse and like I said before, I now believe that my past experience was all a road under construction to the true Lord. And, so you and decided to leave your husband? I decided to leave my husband. So I left my husband after 12 years of marriage. I left my home uh, because we were only married under Islamic law. We weren't married under English law, which meant that I left with nothing. I had my own business. He controlled all the money financially. I know women always say, well, Islam emancipates women. It gives women the right to keep their own wealth and to keep their own finances or have their own property. Of course, Islam gives you that 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 um, lovely gift. But what it doesn't tell you is Islam also says that your husbands have rights over you. So if your husband tells you you can't spend that money or you need to spend that money on your children or on the household, you have no right to say no. Um, you know. Um, so these are things that women don't think of. So when I left my husband, I left with 72 pounds in my back pocket, which is probably the equivalent to $50. Three young children, my youngest daughter was two years old. I had nothing. I literally had nothing. All I knew was I had to get out. Um, and I left. And I don't know how things worked out right, but I know Christ had his hand on me. Even then, you know, as a, as a Muslim, I knew I know Christ was working in my life. So <clears throat> one of my Christian friends, He'd often have deep discussions to, uh, with me about religion. Um, we discussed sort of Hitchens and, and Dawkins because I was sort of becoming this angry woman and I was becoming angry at God and I wanted to, you know, I, I was almost thinking, well, should I become an atheist? But there was something inside me where I, I felt, well, no, I, I think there is a God. You know, there has to be something. Because when I looked at creation, I, I just felt there was a real benevolence of somebody, a creator out there. But I kind of thought it can't be Allah because why would Allah not listen to me? You know, so you know, after 12 years, I really felt that my my personal development was halted. You know, I wasn't learning anymore. My husband wouldn't let me, me, me go to university anymore. I wasn't allowed to read books. I wasn't allowed to do anything, really. My job was now to have children, cook, clean and look after him and his family and to be a good wife. Um, so now I was I was starting to learn again and I was starting to question things again. I was starting to read again. 
And <clears throat> me and this friend, we started to look at evolution and, and Francis Collins and then John Lennox and, you know, all of these different things. And then we came onto the subject of Islam and Islam versus Christianity. So my friend taught me lots of things about Christianity, which really opened my mind to, to many of the misconceptions that I had. And I think there are many of the same misconceptions which which Muslims ha have, such as the Bible's been changed, you know, that old chestnut. So we would debate, you know, about the two religions. I would defend Islam, even though I knew it was unfair and unkind. You know, my defense was always, well, my family never believed in the version of Islam that you're talking about. That's a different version. You know, that's a, that's a heretical version. Uh, that's an extremist version that you're talking about. You know, my family were peaceful. They didn't believe in the barbaric traditions of Muhammad. Um, and then he came to me and he, and he told me about the age of Aisha and when she got married. And when my friend pointed this out to me, I couldn't reconcile that. I just found that absolutely abhorrent. Being a mother myself of a, of a young daughter, I just couldn't see how a 50-year-old man would be able to justify in his heart that it was okay for him to not just marry, but consummate his marriage with a child. And this isn't just any man. This is a man that apparently Allah has sent to this world as a last and final messenger, the perfect messenger. You know, Allah, he's, you know, God is supposed to be all knowing. He knows the beginning to the end. Surely an all knowing God would know that in today's day and age, that would be frowned upon. Um, so this is something that I just couldn't reconcile. So when we sat and compared Jesus to Muhammad, I soon realized that Jesus really was perfect and sinless, unlike Muhammad. But I sat there each night defending Islam and my friend would come back each day with new arguments. You know, he was he didn't know a great deal about Islam, but all of a sudden, he, you know, he was learning from YouTube videos by uh, David Wood and Nabil Qureshi. And, you know, thank God for them, because if it wasn't for them telling the truth, I mean, some people say that, that, that David Wood's videos are quite harsh. Um, but if it wasn't for, for those harsh, truthful, honest videos, I may not have been able to see the truth because my Christian friend may not have been able to equip himself with the actual not true knowledge of Islam. So one of my big, big, biggest arguments at the time was that the Quran was pristine, without contradiction. It was uh, full of scientific miracles. You know, I laugh when I say these things now, but my friend quickly resp responded and left me realizing that the Quran was not <laughs> a book of science at all. Um, we talked about the prophet Muhammad and, and again compared his life to Jesus. And soon it just became so apparent to me that Muhammad was just a mere man who set poor standards for his believers. You know, he married a six-year-old girl. He killed in war. This was something I just couldn't come to terms with. And, uh, you know, how could a pious prophet do all of these things? You know, on the other hand, we had Jesus who was flawless. You know, he was perfection. His character oozed humility. He was love. He was kindness. He was a miraculous savior. He set the perfect example for humankind. And even in Islam, Jesus, known as Isa, was perfect. There was nothing bad about him in the Quran. You know, he was even in the Quran, he was he was deemed as being sinless and perfect. And I, it just really got me thinking, you know, and unknown to me at that time, he was the light and he was the Lord. So my friend equipped me with one of the most valuable tools I've ever, ever been given in my life. He told me to stop lying to myself and to be honest with what was right. And if I wanted to know the truth, to just ask the real God to show, show me who he was. You know, and it was the best piece of advice that somebody, anybody ever gave me because it was 12 months later that this advice, I, I actually took this advice. So 12 months fast forward, I was fed up with my life. I was feeling so alone, so unloved by even by God. And I was raising three young children, which is a mammoth task. And doing it while feeling that God doesn't love you is even more difficult. I had no family. I was depressed. I was at my lowest. I was dealing with the emotional turmoil attached to Islamic divorce. I was having to go through child litigation in court. I was self-representing. I was struggling financially to the point of total breakdown. My family were unsupportive. Um, they were nowhere to be seen. I was having to access food banks because I had no money. Um, I was trying to get my, my Islamic divorce, but my husband wouldn't give me a divorce. So I had to go and apply for a divorce to, to the Islamic Council. And that's called a hula. And they weren't they weren't very happy with me at all. They wanted me to actually go back to my abuser. 
and this was very problematic for me because and let's, let's stop right here for a second i want to emphasize that you're talking about a sharia law court in england not outside that's of right. england that's right so in england there are sharia law there are sharia councils it's called family they, courts yeah absolutely now they legislate on family law that's all they legislate on and this is how islam will slowly slowly creep into the west they will begin by legislating on small things. Oh, it's only family law. It's only things that, that matter to us. It won't impinge on your laws. But this is the problem. When you have a two-tier legal system in your country, all of a sudden, the people that are adhering to those Islamic laws become subjugated. As a woman, I could only turn to Islamic councils. I had no respite in the, in the Isla English legal system at all. They won't listen to you? They will not listen to you if you go there for this uh, kind of case? No, because I was not legally married in Islamic law, uh, ah. in English law, because my husband only married me in Islamic law. And you will find a lot of Muslim men will only marry under Islamic law and not under English law. So there is a loophole. There is a loophole in the system and they're capitalizing on it. Absolutely. And the men know this. And this is why they do it. And because they know that they can use this to control their wives. So I was going through all of this. I was alone and I was absolutely rock bottom. When I was calling these Sharia courts and telling them that my husband had abused me, he'd abused my children, I had been raped and all of these things, they told me this was not a sufficient reason to get the, to apply for a divorce and I was to go back to my husband. And if I didn't, I would be in the hellfire. This is what these men would tell me. So as you can imagine, this was... It was devastating. It was heartbreaking. So I was at my rock bottom limit. I began resent resenting Allah and I became very, very angry at Allah as well. You know, I was be I was so tired of, of doing good and receiving not even an ounce of comfort in return. And I was constantly being told by my family, by my by my friends, by people in the community, Allah tests those who he loves. You know, you are well loved. Allah's testing you because you are well loved. It was funny because I never felt loved at all you know so one day i was sat in my bed and i remember crying crying out to a point where you know i couldn't even breathe i was crying that much i was at the end completely at the end rock bottom and i just asked god listen what more do i have to do to be good what more do i have to be, do to be loved you know take away my burdens take away my pains you know i'm pleading with you now you know show me who you are Whoever you are, I don't care who you are, whether you're the God of Islam, whether you're God of Christianity, whether you're Buddha, you know, I don't care which God you are, whoever you are, show me, just show me who you are. Even if the truth will upset me and tear me away from my friends and my family, I don't care. I need to know the truth because I had a thirst for the truth. And I said, whoever you are, whatever path you pay for me, I will follow it. I will close my eyes and I will follow it and I will divorce everything I've ever known. I fell asleep with a, with swollen eyes, a heavy heart, and a thought that God was angry with me and full of hate, and that my life was burdened with troubles and heartache because Allah didn't love me. You know, I'd, I'd read the Bible as a Muslim, but to be honest, there were just empty words on a page that made no sense. The following morning, I woke up and I downloaded a Bible app on my phone, and I tapped onto my Bible app, and I opened the book of John and I read that book and it made absolute sense to me. My heart was light. I understood what I was reading. It all made perfect sense to me. As I was reading it, I was instinctively crying out, Jesus, that is you. And I was laughing with joy. You know, if anyone was looking at me, they would, they would have thought I was mad. But what happened to me, without a doubt, was the most beautiful experience in all my life my mind had been completely cleared and freed from my disturbing and restless thoughts of depression the insecurity the pain the rejection the hopelessness the, the anger it was all replaced by a deep peace that i'd never felt before and now i understand that that was the peace of god and now i understood what it was like to be to be loved i'd never felt that feeling before ever ever and it was just something that was just so, it, it was, 
it, it was so beautiful it just overtook me the beds were unmade the dishes were unwashed you know the the, the children were still walking around in their pajamas but i kept reading because what i was reading was giving me hope i was understanding it i understood that the lord was love and i understood that jesus is our savior it was just unbelievable you know i spent the whole day reading the bible the beds were unmade you know like i said the dishes were piled high but I realized how truth really can be hidden from us when our hearts are hard and unwilling to understand. And, you know, even if <clears throat> you feel that you are in the truth, if you as if there are Muslims listening today, I want to ask you a question. If you are so convinced that you have the truth on your side, why don't you seek the true God? Why don't you ask for the truth to be revealed to you? If you are so convinced that you are following the true religion, Allah will reveal himself to you. You, you. Your position will never change. But maybe, just maybe, you're not following the true God. Maybe you should ask the question that I asked God. And maybe, just maybe, the truth will be revealed to you. So I had still had lots of questions, despite my joy. I, I had lots of questions. So I, I started texting this friend of mine. Um, by the time he'd responded, I'd already worked out a lot of the answers by just reading the Bible. And a lot of the questions were, you know, how can Christ actually be God? You know, is he God? Is he just a prophet? You know, was the Bible corrupt? You know, all the same things that the Muslims, uh, the, the arguments that the Muslims Muslims give, you know, could God really be, be one God with three elements to him? This can't make sense. How could Jesus be the biological son of God? And I started reading things on the Internet they confused me, so I went back to the Bible. And before I knew it, I understood everything. The next day, this friend of mine decided to take me to the local evangelical church. And that church deacon said that I had the Holy Spirit in me, that I'd had an experience. And I wasn't sure about that. I just thought, OK, whatever. All I knew was I was at home. I was at home. The hymns that they were singing, they were speaking to me. The sermon that was being told uh, that day was about Jonah being in the belly of the whale and I felt that that sermon was speaking directly to me because I was angry at God you know and it was really resonating with me and I kept saying to my friend did you tell these people that I was coming every hymn is speaking to me that sermon is like as though it's speaking directly to me and my friend told me no nobody knows that you were coming honestly this you know this is just a normal service you know one of the things that that, that frightened him was to take me to that church was he felt that um, I would find the people there odd because they always speak in tongues. And I go to that church regularly. And since I've been going, they always speak in tongues. That was the first time ever nobody spoke in tongues at all. And, you know, I remember asking the pastor a, a question. I called it a stupid question. I said, L listen, I've been a good person all my life. You know, if I died, would I still get to heaven, even if I believe in Allah? I've done lots of good things. You know, I've been a really good mother. I've been a good daughter. I've been a good wife. I've been a really good person. Can I still get into heaven? And thank goodness he didn't water down God's word. I wasn't saved. I okay, I don't know. Uh, looks like we're having uh, some technical difficulties. Can uh, uh, can you guys let me know if you are at least able to listen to me? Give me a thumbs up at least. Guide okay. me back. Guide me back. Me back. That, but if I'm right, please give me more confidence. So you, you, were, you, were, you were cut off just for a second when you were saying you asked the, the pastor a question. And, and that, that yes. part was cut off, yes. Okay, so I asked the question. I, I said it was a stupid question. I said, look, I've always been a good person all my life. I've never done anything bad. You know, I've been a good mother, daughter. I've done lots of good things in my life can i still get to heaven as a muslim and and thank goodness he told me the truth he said no jesus is the way the truth and the life you need christ you need to repent of your sins and you need to accept jesus christ into your heart and i'm so glad that he told me that because i left that church as a christian i left that church believing that jesus christ was lord and that i couldn't play emotional or mental gymnastics and think well okay i believe this but i can still be good and do this i left as a christian that was my that was me putting my seal saying christ i am yours now i am yours so after that i mean i researched a lot i prayed a lot on countless occasions i cried out almighty ruler of heaven and earth you know if i'm wrong please guide me back to islam but if i'm right give me the confidence in my in my faith in jesus christ and time after time 
Jesus gave me the answers that I needed. He put the right people in my path and he began opening doors, which only a few weeks ago had never existed. You know, the Lord, he, he works in great and mysterious ways. And it's not easy to take a precarious road from one faith to another, especially Islam to Christianity. And often, you know, we journey in secret and without any companions. And even sometimes when God seems, seems far, it's a road where you treat everyone with suspicion. And after all, you know, the wrong decision could lead to eternal damnation. But I now know that I have come through to the other side. And, you know, I continue my daily pilgrimage towards Christ. And I know that turning back is absolutely not an option. And I have literally had to divorce my old life, my old friends. Many members of my family are either now in, in the past. Um, I still have a, a relationship with some members of my family, but it's very awkward and very strained. But I will always choose Christ over even my own mother and father, who I love dearly and pray, pray that they come to the, to the faith before it's too late. But I can truly say, um, that when I look back now at Islam, with confidence, with certainty and clarity, that Islam is not a religion from the Almighty. The Quran is just a book, and Muhammad was just a man with twisted morals. I no longer fear Allah, because I know Allah doesn't exist. There's only one Christ, and Christ alone. And it really humbles me to know that our Lord, our Saviour, sent himself to save us, us, a micro, us who live on this microscopic, minute part of this universe, who are full of so much sin, but yet he came for me, he came for you. Amen. We don't need intercessors. We don't need Muhammad. We don't need to cry out to a God that doesn't doesn't answer prayer. We don't need to do works. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, and this is this is the main part of of, of my testimony. You know, as a Muslim, as a comparison, I was beginning, I was lost, I was broken, and I was unloved. Allah never came. He never he 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 never answered, but Jesus did. He came when I was diminished. He came when I was lost. He came when I was broken. He Amen. came when I was unloved. And he gave me all of those things that I needed. He replaced what the locusts had ate away. I now have the living God abiding in me. And when I look back at my very short journey uh, that I share with you, I, all I can say is that he's been faithful, he's been forgiving, and he, he's been so loving. You know, he's weaved his way in my life in so many different ways from feeling totally worthless and unloved. You know, Jesus plucked me up and he warmed my frozen heart. He gave me true love. He taught me how to love unconditionally. And it's he who's changed my heart, not me. You know, I was being made homeless. You know, I was having to access food banks, but I put my trust in him to look after me and my children. And he has, he's looked after me and my children. And he's, he's opened so many doors for me. I have my own <clears throat> ministry now where I, uh, I'm helping ex-Muslims um, here in England. I don't know what it's like where you are, but here in England, ex-Muslims are still having to live in the closet, uh, which is obviously a frightening thing because we live, you know, we live in the 20th century. There's an assumption that we live in, in a country where we're protected by rule of law. Of course we are. But Muslims who are leaving Islam still cannot come out and openly say that we are now rejecting Islam and we have come to, to Christ. Because that's probably one of the worst things that a Muslim can do, is to re reject Islam and then come to Christ. I have a Muslim friend who lives in the Northeast and only just before Ramadan started, he sent me a message saying, look, I need help. You know, you're the only ex-Muslim that I know who I can reach out to. He, he's a husband, he has a wife, he has children, he lives with his, his family. He can't leave all of that. I left all of that. Jesus gave me a way out, he gave me strength. But there are other, yeah. other people that are still having to live in the closet and leave double lives. How, how horrible is that? How horrible is that? As a Christian, if a, a Christian was to leave, okay, you can leave. What are the repercussions? You're not going to be liked for a short while. People are going to call you back to the faith. People are still going to love you. But in Islam, what are the repercussions? Let me tell you what the repercussions are. The repercussions, if I was living in Saudi Arabia under Islamic law, I would be dead. That's what the repercussions are. These are the very real repercussions that we are dealing with. It's only because I'm living in this country that I'm protected by rule of law. But even then, I have to be careful. I won't openly go out in my community and, and declare to people that this is who I am. And this is because I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid for my children's life. Hallelujah. You know, is my life perfect now that I've come to Christ? 
absolutely not. I still have the same problems, but I have a mighty God that walks by me every Amen. day. And he's with me. When I'm in that Amen. pit, he's with me. He walks with me. And I can glorify him and I can turn to him and know that he will answer me because he loves me. Yep. Amen. That's an amazing testimony. Thank you so much, of course, for sharing at least this part. I know you probably have even longer than that, but uh, I mean, I just want to share this comment. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see the comment in front of you? So this is just something I want to bless you with. I mean, people are paying attention to what you're saying and they are blessed by it. So uh, and indeed, it is a blessing, no doubt about that. So there are some questions that were asked here. For some reason, I'm unable to see the uh, comments, by the way, from Facebook. So I may toggle back and forth uh, if I can. But uh, there were a couple of interesting questions here. Let me see if I can come across them. And while while I'm doing this, I want to ask you, you know, so tell us a little bit more about the, I mean, I'm familiar with the Quran only, of course, movement. Some people do not. Please share a little bit more about the Quran only and how did your parents and how did you and even even those in your immediate sphere who follow the Quran only could survive the constant attack from mainstream Muslims. Okay, so the Quran only approach is basically you only look to the Quran for all your guidance. Now, my family, they were not particularly religious. My, my father, when he came from Pakistan, he decided to take on British norms and values and he decided to integrate and assimilate. So his religion was secondary. So I think it was easy for him to just look at the Quran. But in the community, he was frowned upon. Many people in the community actually said that he wasn't even a Muslim, but he was revered and well respected because he was a, a well-established businessman. And for that reason, uh, he still held uh, he was still held in high esteem within the community. Um, but as far as the Hadith is concerned, my father, he, he was a learned man. He was quite well read. And when he read the Hadith from his own logic, he couldn't reconcile normal morals, you know, normal the normal moral law that we all live by. He couldn't reconcile that with, with a lot of the things that were coming out of the Hadith. So he kind of thought, well, okay, let's let's leave that to one side. I always say that my father, he was an a la carte Muslim, because even in the Quran, he would only pick and choose all the bits that were peaceful and nice, and he would ignore all the bad stuff in there. Because let's be honest, there's lots of bad things in the Quran. You know, you and I know that more than anybody else. But he would only he would only cherry pick the things that were peaceful um, and, and that he liked. And that really, unfortunately, isn't a true Muslim. Unfortunately, that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a comment uh, from someone. Uh, please don't take things personal. We have some lost people in here. And here is one of them uh, who is kind of funny, by the way. He calls himself the truth seeker. Don't let the name fool you. He is a <laughs> troll. OK, you know what a troll is. OK, so okay. so we're going to put his comment here because we want to entertain everybody. So he's saying your claims here prove nothing. Many non-Muslims are led to Islam by positive spiritual experience. Could you speak into those who are led to Islam, especially from a female side of uh, uh, side of you? Well, look, uh, ultimately, people can believe whatever they want to believe. OK, but there is only one truth. And the real truth will be revealed to those who have pure, who have a pure heart. Spiritual experiences can be denounced, be denounced by anyone. But if you were to actually do a, a, a real in, intellectual study of the Quran and the Bible, let's forget about spiritual experiences for a moment. An intellectual study of the Bible and the Quran with an open mind. You have to have an open mind and study them both. You will find that the Quran is full of contradictions. It's full of backward dogmas. It's full of things that you cannot reconcile. However, the Bible, it's it, there's no contradictions in it. And also you've got historical evidences which will back up and support the, the, uh, the Bible. The Quran, where, where are the historical evidences of the Quran? The Quran is actually a self-referencing book because the Quran historically um, elevates itself through its own evidences. There's nothing external that, that, that will compound the Quran or will point to the Quran as it being uh, authentic. And it's the same for the Hadiths. So, you know, you can talk about people join Islam because of spiritual uh, experiences. They're not the right spiritual experiences. The spirit, exactly. there's two spiritualities, one's light, which is Christ, and the other one's darkness. So maybe they're having a spiritual experience, which is from the other side, unfortunately, brother. 
That is true. That I mean, the, 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 the Bible teaches that even Satan can masquerade as a, an angel of light. So, I mean, uh, sometimes people really undermine and underestimate the power of darkness. You know, uh, you have demonic powers. And if you're not really seeking the truth, you may not be able to ex distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. That's why, you know, praying is important, asking God to guide you with a sincere heart. And the Holy Spirit definitely can do the work as he did with you and with all of us. So let me share another question. I think this is a good question, uh, really, for uh, both of us to interact with. I'm going to start with you first. Can you see that question? The question is, is it effective to be directly and sometimes harsh when you speak about Islam, I mean, uh, there is so many debates about this. There is so many, like some people like CP, Christian Prince. Some people do not like him. Some people will like Sam Shimon. Some, die. some people do not like his approach. Some, uh, some people will like David Wood. And so what do you say about that? I mean, uh, as a seeker, any of these approaches maybe were helpful to you? Okay, I'm going to be brutally honest now. When, uh, when I was seeking and my friend would watch David Wood, Wood's videos and then we would watch them together, as a Muslim, David Wood absolutely infuriated me. He made me really angry, but I'm glad he did because he stirred within me a passion to actually find out what the truth was because I was hell-bent then on saying, right, I'm going to prove him wrong. And then that made me go back and look at my scriptures because you have to understand, a lot of Muslims don't actually know what's within their own scriptures. They're cultural Muslims. That actually forced me to go back to my scriptures and to actually look into it deeply. And when I did that, all it did was confirm David Wood and what he was saying. So really, it helped me. And somebody else has actually said this to me that, you know, we have to as Christians, you know, we have to be loving. And sometimes it can be quite harsh if we come across saying these things. But unfortunately, the truth often can be difficult. You know, I would rather um, hurt somebody with the truth than comfort them with a lie, because ultimately this is this is eternal. We're talking about eternal issues here. We're not talking about, oh, you know, Amen. you don't look nice today. That doesn't suit you today. These are eternal issues. These are things to do with your salvation. And it's not just about today and tomorrow. This is eternity that we're talking about. So if it means that we have to speak the truth um, and the truth is hurtful, you can still say that in love. You know, you can still say it in love. You know, in the end of it, you can present the facts and still say, you know, I, I still love you, sister. Or I still love you, bro brother. And I'm telling you these things because I love you. But we have to speak in truth. And I think that is so important as Christians that we do tell the truth because it's I think many Christians feel like they they shouldn't be saying certain things because it, it might be hurtful. It might hurt their feelings. I, I don't think that's the right approach. If that if that approach was taken with me, I would probably still be stuck in Islam. So praise God that that Christian was honest with me. Amen. And I know you want to be careful to say also that. Um, we do not want to be harsh for the sake of mocking. We want to be harsh with the truth. the truth. You know, the truth definitely is going to be harsh as long as we're really seeking to share facts with people. Now, I mean, uh, here is what I say to people usually, and please, uh, you know, uh, interject your thoughts. I mean, I tell people, if you want to go and witness to a Muslim, I mean, uh, I, I don't see a reason why you should start with the harsh truth. We need to focus on sin and salvation. And along the way, things will come up and discussion will lead into sharing harsh truth. But I don't want to start with fighting with them because that may close Absolutely. the door. Absolutely. And I think that's very, very important because ultimately you, you should always try and start on the premise of a friendship because once you have that friendship that's when the conversation is open that's when you can converse with somebody if you start on a premise of of of, of, of saying lots of horrible things immediately you're going to close that conversation down and once you close that conversation down you're not going to be able to witness to them anymore so i think you have to it is very very difficult but if you can if you can build some kind of friendship or some kind of common ground or some kind of platform where you can converse in truth with one another and say look you know I still love you but I, I, you know we need to have these conversations because this is what me and my Christian friend did you know I knew that he was my friend I knew he had good intentions I knew he wasn't saying these things to hurt me personally we were having a, a, an intellectual debate about two religions and it just so happened that you know whilst we were debating lots of horrible things were coming out in this debate but they were truthful things um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, Jesus says the truth shall set you free. And that is very, very important because truth gives freedom. And if I wasn't told the truth, I would still be stuck in those shackles of Islam. 
That's right. <laughs> We're gonna, uh, there is another important uh, question here, and I think you as a female can definitely uh, give a, a, a powerful response to it. So here, here's the question in front of you. Uh, the gentleman is saying he's a Christian and he has a, a Muslim girlfriend. And obviously this is causing problem as expected. I mean, it, it happens all the time, whether you are a female Christian dating a Muslim man or vice versa. What would you like to advise this person? Okay, this is, uh, I've been asked this a few times actually. So when you converse with your Muslim girlfriend, I'm pretty sure that she's going to come back and she's going to say, well, in Islam, I'm given lots of rights as a woman. I think it's important in love and you have to tread very carefully when you do this. You have to highlight the lack of uh, freedoms Islam gives to a woman. So things like, I mean, don't go into this straight away, but things like, you know, a, a husband's allowed to beat his wife. You know, that's maybe she doesn't know these things. I didn't know these things until somebody pointed these out to me. You know, Muhammad said, you know, women are going to be the main dwellers within the hellfire because of their ungratefulness to their husbands. Women are of deficient mind. Two two witnesses are needed uh, if they're if they're a woman over one man. You know, these are all things that maybe she doesn't know. Maybe you need to start. You know, bringing bringing out these these uh, items of discussion with her about how women are actually treated truly under Islam, not under her version of Islam, not under her cultural aspect uh, version of Islam, not under the Islam that that she's grown up with, which may not be the true Islam. You need to bring scripture to her and tell her in truth, and maybe do a comparison of what Jesus says in the same instance. You know, in Surah, I think it's Surah Al Nisa, where it says. Men are the protectors and maintainers of women, but they are superior to women. Exactly. Chapter 4, verse 34. Exactly. There you go. They're superior to women. You know, you need to highlight these things to, to you know, the testimony about women. It says, bring two witnesses from among your men. Should there not be two men? Bring a man and two women. So half of a testimony, you know, two women? Why, why two women? I thought we were equal. I thought men and women were equal under Islam. Clearly they're not. You know, so highlight these issues and show, uh, show, show this girl that, you know, there, there is no freedoms in Islam for, for women. Women subjugate, um, Islam subjugates women. Islam takes away freedoms from women. I, as a mother under Islam, was having to give up my seven-year-old son to my husband under Sharia law, under Islam, because he felt that I was not going to bring up my children correctly under the Islamic faith. So how is that nice? How is that fair for women? You know, exactly. these are the things that I think you really, really need to approach when it comes to uh, speaking to her. And it's not going to be an easy conversation. You have to do it carefully, but you have to do it honestly. That's true. That's and, true. you know, uh, if I may add uh, your sister, excellent answer, of course, uh, even though she's 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 the female in the uh, in the equation here in a relationship, still Islam has a sense of superiority. So she will be the one who's going to try to force Islam on him, not the other way around. And even right now, she may tell him anything he wants to hear. And I'm sorry for being, by the way, blunt, brother. I just want to be fair to you. Um, you know, light has nothing to do with darkness. And I'm so sorry to be blunt. We're talking about harsh, uh, you know, reality, harsh truth. This is one of those, by the way. Uh, she may tell you whatever you want to hear, and she may even wait until you have a child when you're really stuck now. And then you'll begin to see how Islam will start to trump over you. It is not entirely up to her, by the way. The imam will get involved. Her family will get involved. So it's not entirely up to her. So she herself will find herself in a tough position anyway. Now, here's the interesting thing, dear sister. I mean, I grew up in, in Saudi Arabia, as you know. That's where I was born and raised. And I've always, always believed that a Muslim man can marry a Christian or a Jew, and you are discouraged from marrying, uh, let's say, an infidel, but you are superior to them anyway, and the goal is to convert him. But I've always also taught that a Christian woman, I mean, a, a Muslim woman cannot marry a Christian man or a Jewish man. Yet the reality is there isn't such prohibition in the Quran, period. It doesn't even exist, which is a testimony to the fact that Islam is a man-made religion altogether. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very, very good point. And since we're talking about Saudi Arabia, there is something else that I would like to share, actually, because I, yes, I, I went and I did the Hajj in Saudi Arabia. Tell me about your experience. I, it, <laughs> Well, maybe this is something that this Christian brother can share with his Muslim girlfriend as well. 
So as you know, Saudi Arabia, the uh, Mecca and Medina are probably the most sacred places known to, to Muslims. They're a place of sanctuary and safety. Whilst I was in the, the actual mosque, the Haram Sharif, um, and it was a call to prayer, everyone goes to pray. You know, you can't look up, you can't look around, everyone's praying. There was nowhere for me to pray. And then this guard ushered me over and he kind of pointed towards his chair and he, you can pray here. So I thought, well, that's very kind of him, very nice gentleman. I can pray on his chair. As I was praying, and as I bent down to to do my 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 ruku, and as I got up, I felt somebody groping me from behind, and I was being sexually assaulted whilst I was praying my asr namaz. Mm. Now this is the most sacred. I'm so sorry, dear sister, but I want to just affirm what you just said. I knew male friends who would go to the Hajj just for purposes like this. So you're not sharing anything that is not realistic. Yeah. So this is, you know, these are the things that happen in, in the most sacred place known to, to Muslim men and women. But furthermore, we, Muslim women are told to cast a garment over them, you know, to be modest. You know, men are, men, men are told to lower their gaze, but Muslim women are also told that, you know, they need to dress modestly because they're not to attract themselves, they're not to speak loudly, they're not, to, you know, to, to walk a certain way because it attracts attention. Now, when I was in Hajj, be rest assured, I was dressed appropriately. I was dressed in the full black attire, but yet I was still groped. But yet I was still sexually assaulted, not once, but twice on two different occasions whilst I was in Saudi Arabia. Now, how can anybody tell me that this is a religion which sanctifies, respects uh, and, and, and elevates women? It, it clearly isn't, because this is not just a, a, a story of isolation. This has happened to many women. If you take the internet now, there are blogs of women where they've, they've actually, they're actually sharing their stories anonymously. Now, whilst this, I was going through this, I, in my mind, I was thinking, right, what do I do? Do I scream? Do I, do I turn around? Do I confront this, this man? But immediately I, I, I weighed out the consequences. What would happen to me as a woman with no witnesses who, ha, who, is, exactly. who is claiming that she has just been sexually assaulted? Exactly, exactly. You will be a minority and they're not going to even believe a word you're saying. In fact, he, he will make the claims like, hey, it's it's crowded. I mean, I didn't do anything, you know, and everybody will be on his side saying, I, he's right. It's crowded. You should Absolutely. be in the, in the woman's section. Why are you here? I mean, I, trust me, you know, we know exactly how these games are played, sadly. But, okay. um, uh, you know, dear sister, is your life in any, I mean, I understand uh, you, you're abroad and I understand that you are a believer in Christ and I understand that there is freedom where you're at, but do you feel that your life is still in any kind of danger, even though you live in an environment that should allow you democracy and freedom? Yes, that's a short answer. Yes, I cannot publicly come out uh, and quite happily in, in my immediate community and say, I'm a Christian. I've I've turned away from from Islam, and uh, this is what I believe now. Because ultimately, when I when I left Islam, it was I mean it's been seven seven years now since I've left, and it's only now that I've I've, I've gained the courage to be able to come out and speak more about my faith and to actually do more open work within the community. But the community completely it completely alienated themselves from me. Uh, when when I walked away from Islam, and that was without me even saying that I was a Christian, they could see outwardly that I was no longer a Muslim because I wasn't wearing a headscarf anymore. I wasn't going to mosque. I wasn't fasting. I wasn't doing any of these things. You know, I was almost like a wayward wo woman within the community. Um, and sort of two years ago, I started holding Bible classes in my in my home, and it was one summer's evening, and we left the window open. And bearing in mind, I lived in a in a heavily um, populated Muslim area where I could even hear the call to prayer from my bedroom window and whilst we were doing this Bible study the following day I would have um, rubbish all over my driveway my bin bags had been emptied all over my driveway my car had been scratched a, a dead mouse had been left on my front doorstep uh, so it's not it's not something that you can do openly there's a, there are lots of ex-Muslims who I know that live in secret they live double lives so they at the moment they're fasting they will celebrate Eid they will go to mosque, but yet in their hearts, they don't believe in Islam. They believe in Christianity. And this is this is tragic because I am living in a Western cult, uh, country where I am supposed to be protected by, by the rule of law and have these freedoms and, 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 and democracy. But the truth is, we're not. We are not protected. And this is why I do what I do, where I'm trying to highlight um, the, the flight of ex-Muslims uh, within the UK and try and give them 
not safe spaces. Why should we have a safe space? Why should we be pushed into a safe, safe space as ex-Muslim Christians? We should be allowed to live our lives as everybody else. If I want to go and do things in the community, I should be allowed to do that still. You know, I should be allowed to go uh, grocery shopping where I usually go and not feel that I'm not allowed to go there anymore because, you know, I'm going to be frowned upon or somebody's going to attack me. You know, right. I had to take my children out of school because they were going to a school which was in the Asian community and I had to move them home. I had to move them to sort of eight miles. It was an eight mile round trip. But I did that because I was an ex-Muslim because I didn't feel safe. Yeah. Um, any type of ministry you're involved in right now, by the way, that uh, you like to share uh, with uh, with us? Maybe any wisdom in whether you focus on women only, whether you focus on Muslims in general, any advice, any wisdom you can share with us? Yeah, so when I came to Christ, I, I made a promise to Christ that I would walk whatever path he, he set before me. And he seems to be setting lots of different routes before me and I'm being obedient and walking them. So I've set up a charity, which is about four years old now where I feed the children within my borough. Um, so we do 20,000 meals every year for, for children and the main uptake um, are, are actually children from the Muslim community. And we do this as Christians, you know, we shine a light for Christ and we, we, we feed their, their stomachs, but we also feed them spiritually. We try and reach out to them through faith in action. Um, so I've set up this, this, uh, this charity and that is not just dealing with Muslims, that is to deal with anyone in society that's broken because look let's have the let's have the the honesty that everyone needs christ we're all broken absolutely everyone needs christ so so we reach out to the broken um but another ministry that i'm 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 keen to get more involved in is the ex-muslims um i was looking to actually launch an event at the house of lords um in the next couple of months but because of the covid that's obviously being halted now so that is something that i'm still going to be exploring um so we're going to be taking 12 stories the house of lords of the 12 apostates and sharing our journeys and what we have to go through to highlight what we live through and you know the fact that you know the government has to do more to help protect us and to help us lead just normal lives uh, does, this, does this charity have any name that you can share uh with people um, it does have a name but i i i don't want to share that because that would okay would be absolutely I'm gonna put a question for you, a topic that been brought up many times and me and Jay addressed it at one point and he and Hatoon also addressed this before. So I'm gonna put the question on the screen here. Um, do you have any opinions uh, regarding this grooming gangs in the US? So you mean the Muslim gro grooming gangs? That's right, that's right. Yeah, so this is something that is rife and it has been rife for, for, for a long, long time here in the UK. And it's something that the government is, is ignoring they don't want to call it out for what it is it is due to islam these are muslims that are committing this crime it's not the sikhs it's not the hindus it is the muslims that are committing these crimes and it is because these white young girls are not seen as as they're, they're seen as meat and that's the truth because they are kafirs at, at the end of the day the quran tells them that they are the worst of creatures that they're unimportant and that and these men are actually going out looking for these young girls and raping them categorically one after the other after the other and there is nothing that is happening really in the uk where people are where these men are being held to account and a lot of the reasons why they're not being held to account is because of racism you know the british government don't want to be called racist they don't want to be called out as racist and also they don't want to be called islamophobes and because of that reason these young British girls are being raped categorically. And until somebody is able to stand up and actually say, look, you know, this enough is enough. And there are, you know, there are political parties here in the UK now who are actually speaking up about this. I mean, the mainstream parties are not speaking up about this, but there's a new party that's just being formed. It's about three years old called For Britain. And they are actually speaking about these, um, these issues, that the Muslim grooming gangs. And they're actually highlighting that this is Islam. This is th these are Muslim issues, and unless they are dealt with, um, and unless these people are, are reprimanded according to the one rule of law, you know this is not going to go away. Because unfortunately, what you will find in this country—I don't know if it's the same in America—Muslims almost operate on a two-tier legal system. It's almost like they don't abide by the same rule of law. Of you know, and the conversation is always closed down because people don't want to. The, the police authority don't want to get called racist. And this is this is tragic because these young girls, you know, they're they're being raped and pillaged by these by these men. 
So, uh, you know, I liked your question at the beginning. You said that the Muslim grooming gang, does that mean there is non-Muslim grooming gangs that have the same issues that you're aware of? Not particularly, no. That, that, doesn't that, mean that answered the question. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, you know, people of other communities don't rape. Of course, you know, rape is a horrible, horrible act and it exists within all communities. But Islam actually condones these actions. You know, they're slaves. What does Islam say about slaves? You know, men can take slaves. They can take captives. Of so course. why should these... I mean, the why should these young men, absolutely. So why should these young men then not take these slaves and captives? Okay, they're not dressed as the old school slaves as we remember, you know, as, as they were historically. But these are modern day slaves. These are modern day captives. Um, and, and it's a huge, huge problem. And unless, unless people start telling the truth about this, and people are starting to speak up about this in, in the UK, they are starting to talk about Islam and the problems that exist within Islam. But what you are finding is those people are now being being told that they are racist, they're Islamophobes, and freedom of speech now is slowly, slowly, slowly being closed down in this country. Hmm, that's interesting and pretty sad, actually. Um, a question here uh, probably ties back into the uh, Sharia law courts. Uh, are Muslim men allowed to have more than one wife? Of course. <laughs> of in course. the UK? In the UK, well... According to British law, they are not allowed to have more than one wife, but many Muslim men will marry under Sharia only. So they will do nikah and they will have more than one wife. They will have up to three, they will have up to four wives. They will, they will have the limit. I mean, my ex, my ex-husband's uncle had two wives, hmm. you know, and he was claiming benefits for both wives. And it was, it was just an absolute hot pot of, of terrible things that were going on, you know, they were claiming benefits, you know, they were doing everything that that, that, that that they weren't supposed to be doing. You know, they had two different households running and both of them were provided by the state. You know, they had four children each that, again, they were being looked after by the state because of the, the state were providing them with extra benefits. And this is rife within the, within the Pakistani and the Muslim community. This is not something that's unheard of. Hmm. There is a question. I mean, I, I don't want to, I mean, uh, it does have a political tone to it. Uh, uh, somebody saying, would you recommend an ex-Muslim move into Britain? And let me broaden it up a little bit. Would you recommend an ex-Muslim to move to Europe in general based on your experience? I can speak for the US and I can say, I don't see any problem, of course. I mean, our rights are still protected, but I cannot speak really for Britain or the uh, Europe. I don't want to sound like I'm the expert and the go-to guy here. Okay, well, again, I'm not, I'm not the expert, but what I can say is depending on where you're coming from, if you are coming from the Middle East, then, of course, the UK is definitely going to be a much safer place for you to come to. Um, if you were to go to somewhere maybe like Germany or, or France, I personally wouldn't recommend that because there are lots of, of Muslims that have, that have already migrated there who are known to be sort of ex-jihadis, um, and I really don't think that your life would be safe there as an ex-Muslim. I think the UK is probably still going to be your safest option, again, depending on where you're coming from. Thank you. Let me see if there is any other comments here. Um, there is a comment from Facebook. It's saying, I heard that if a Muslim man rapes or does uh, you know, a, a sexual relationship with non-Muslim girls, it isn't a sin. Um, are you aware of any such thing uh, as far as a crime is concerned? Let me answer it from a Quranic standpoint. If you view the person, as you alluded to it, as what your right hand possess, then it isn't a sin. I mean, it's condoned and approved by the teaching, the highest authority, the Quran, technically speaking. But um, let's say it wasn't, I mean, obviously, how can you justify that you have someone who is a slave unless if you admit that you did purchase that person? Just the way it's happening right now under these grooming gangs, do they justify it as being what your right hand possess or how do they get around that? No, I, I don't think they, they justify it like that, but they don't see anything wrong with it because culturally it, it, it's almost inbred in them that young white girls are trash. They're, they're worthless, you know, and, and, and women, you know, women are, are, are ultimately just views, viewed as sex objects by Muslim men. Even if you're a Muslim woman, you are still viewed as a sexual object. And especially a, a non-believing woman, a, a Kafir woman, is even more so viewed as, uh, as an object of, of, uh, of, of for your sexual desires. So, I mean, one of the other things that I would like to add is there was, um, I think it was a hadith which, which talked about when you sin, if you sin, Allah will cover your sins. 
But if you then go out and proclaim your sins, that's when your that that's when your sins aren't going to be forgiven. So a lot of Muslims, when they when they sin, if they do these things in quiet and in closed doors, and you know, and they and they don't go and brag about it, they're going to get forgiven. And if they're yeah. doing these yeah. things, these minor sins, and if they're praying there five times in a mile, their sins are going to get forgiven. You know, if they've got a major sin, then that's up to Allah, of course. But if they're going to perform the Hajj and do their Umrah and you know do all of these good works, then ultimately, you know, Allah will forgive their sins. So that's why they don't see they don't see any um, any problem in doing these things. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting as you were saying this about uh, keeping it private. Everything in Islam is backward. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew says, you need to do your religious duties in private, praying in private, fasting in private, appealing to your Father in heaven private. Don't make it announced to everybody. And your sin basically need to be, you know, you need to technically speak and admit that you're a sinner and come to Christ and get baptized and so on and so on. In Islam, it's backward. Keep your sin secret, you know, keep it to yourself. You're fine. Your God will going to cover it for you, to you, but announce that you're a righteous person publicly. Pray Absolutely. publicly, fast publicly. What a, This is the greatest cover-up in the history of mankind, actually. That's what it is. It really is. It really is. And it's also, I mean, Isla, I would say the Quran is the most spectacularly misunderstood book in the whole of mankind. Because whenever you speak to Muslims, they will tell you it's a perfect book, no contradictions. You know, it's, it, it has everything in there. And yet it's full of backward dogmas. It's contradictory. It doesn't make sense even to read it. Even to read it, it jumps from one thing to another and it doesn't make sense. Up is down, black is white. And unfortunately, when people are born into that, that faith, they are really indoctrinated from birth. I really believe that the, the first victims of Islam are the Muslims, you know, and they, they really are oh, yeah. nothing else. Because when you are born into that faith, there is no reason for you not to believe that. Because from the moment you are born, you have the Shahada blown into your ears and you're brought up with your parents believing reciting um and and actually thinking that everything that you are taught you don't need to read it you're taught this you don't need to read it lots of muslims won't even go to their quran they will learn through their imams they will learn through their parents and they will learn things parrot fashion and it's tragic really because when that happens the brain is disengaged and the heart is just full of lies that's where it is the heart's full of lies and it's full of darkness and one of the things that i would implore muslims to do is please pick up your Quran, study it, read it, read it and compare it to compare it to the Bible and you will be shown the truth. When I started getting into the actual text of the Quran, you know, I'm not I, I'm not saying that I'm an intellect, but just as an average woman, I knew that there were real serious problems within the Quran and I could see that. So pick up the Quran. Amen. Uh, I know your picture is frozen for some reason. Can you still hear us? Okay, so we still have the same technical issue. We'll wait for a second here. I'm gonna. Uh, I want to address uh, a question by. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you were frozen. You're back now, but uh, there is a question by Petro. Uh, I'm trying to find his full name here. I'm sorry, uh, Petro. Uh, you were asking a question about. You said you have a friend who is a Muslim, and uh, she said that it's okay for her to lie, and you wanted the the chapter. Uh, and the verse in the Quran that allows for this. I think you're talking about what we call the doctrine of taqiyya to cover up basically uh, the idea of hiding things or lying for the purpose of protecting Islam. If that's what you're referring to, and if that's what your friend is referring to, then one of the many verses in the Quran that appeals to this doctrine or endorse it is chapter 8, verse 23 in the Quran. Chapter 8, verse 23 would be one of those. Um, there was a question here. Um, unfortunately, we lost that question, and I'm trying to remember. Uh, forgive me, dear sister here. Any any final thoughts, by the way, that you want to share with us? I know you like apologetics. Uh, the way we get connected is through a mutual friend that we have. This mutual friend is the one who witnessed to my wife, actually, before she came to Christ. And uh, and I'm definitely thankful for the, the dear brother and his ministry. Um, do you feel like, uh, you know, apologetic is something that maybe in the future consider coming on the show and we can take it topic by topic? Is this something that uh, is appealing to you? I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just uh, extending an invitation because we're getting a lot of encouraging comments about people would like to see you again. 
Yeah, apologetics is definitely something that um, that's always interested interested me. Um, when I, I mean, only recently, you know, um, it was a Michigan School of Apologetics, and I would recommend that to 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 anyone out there who's wanting to get into apologetics. You know, it's it gives you sound a, a really sound foundation to really build upon, and it is something that I would really like to get into. I almost feel that I'm not maybe learned enough in the Quran to be able to do apologetics. However, I've lived islam and that counts for something and, and that's the thing we want it the practical thing i mean it's really not the hit uh, hit knowledge it's the practical knowledge so let's explore uh ways for you to come back there is a final question i'm gonna, we're gonna ask and then we'll close and uh, it's bart uh, a dear brother uh here we thank him all the time for his participation he's asking an excellent question you can see it right here about the inheritance and the uh, probate uh when it comes to uh, Muslims living in the UK, obviously. I mean, the fact that you're under Sharia law now, everything changes. Everything changes. Absolutely, everything changes. I mean, under under Sharia, women don't get, female children will not get the same as their male counterparts. Uh, we know that under Sharia. Under, under the UK law, if you're a Muslim, you know, we are subjected to the, uh, the UK probate law. However, if there is a, if there is um a will in place which is in accordance to Sharia that will take precedence that will be used in court um, in, in the probate court so for for example if if my father was to pass away for example and he didn't have a will then his wealth would be um, subjected to UK probate law however as a Muslim you will find many Muslims will put some kind of um, writing together under under Sharia rules to ensure that their sons get double what their daughters get. It is really amazing to me how they can still get away with stuff like that when when you have a a you know a country that have a legal system it has a constitution and yet they'll look the other way sadly and not realizing that people can use these kind of loopholes. I lied when I said it was the last question. We have one of our amazing volunteers asking a question about did you I mean I understand you're a Quran only but uh, uh, as part of your upbringing uh, did you get exposed to the sira? which is the uh, biography of Muhammad, his life. Did you come across the story about his marriage, for instance, to Aisha before that? Or do others, even if you consider yourself not to be that devout at that time, do others get exposed to that kind of stuff who are Quran only? Uh, no, I, well, as I was growing up, I wasn't really exposed to that at all. Um, it was when I got married and because they did believe they weren't Quranists, they were Sunni Muslims that believed in the Hadith as well. And that's when my exposure, start. I started to get exposure uh, about the Hadith. And somebody did actually give me a, a, a book, which was a Sira of the Prophet Muhammad. But I couldn't read it. You know, I started reading it and I just felt it was ju it just within me. It just. It didn't sit right within me because I, I guess I was still um, I was still a Quranist Muslim and I, and I you know I was still confounded by what my parents had taught me. But generally, Muslims as they are growing up, the Prophet is highly revered, almost more than Allah. You know, the Prophet. You know, here in this country, the Prophet's birthday is celebrated every year. You know, you, we have celebrations in the street where the Prophet's uh, birthday is celebrated, and the Prophet is revered even highly than Allah. I mean, if somebody was to say something bad about the Prophet you would be in big trouble, big, big trouble, because he's so highly revered. So as young children, when my son was going to mosque, he certainly was learning about the life of Prophet, you know, how he dressed, you know, the way he was, you know, how he ate, you know, how he prayed. You know, my son would come home from, from mosque and he would say, you know, mom, you're not allowed to listen to music. Why? Because Muhammad said so in the Hadith. You know, and he would quote Hadith to me. Mummy, when you are entering the bathroom, do you know you need to enter with this specific foot and say this specific specific prayer and this oh, yeah. was a, a young boy yeah and this was a young boy telling me this and this was all alien to me because obviously I wasn't born like this but these things are being taught in the UK mosques you know to you to very very young children children are going here going to mosque here from the age of four if not younger sometimes so you can imagine the indoctrination that they are suffering and and the and the uh, the education that they are that, that they are given about Muhammad and everything's justified they are told how old uh, Aisha was when she got married, but everything is justified. And that's why when they grow up, they then have arguments saying, well, that was okay at that time. You know, th that was no problem. Mm -hmm. But what we need to do is we need to teach people that, you know, you need to have an open mind and you need to ask questions and you need to do research for yourself.
Amen. And and we have a, a person that I'm going to take the privilege of answering uh, this question, as we expected, of course. You know, uh, our Muslim friends love basically to come up with the, the most stupid and dumb excuses ever, you know, and I'm sorry to be harsh here. And here is an example of that. She doesn't know basic Islam. Okay, let me give you basic Islam, my friend. The first pillar, you have to believe in Allah and equate a man by the name Muhammad next to him. That's idolatry. Number two, you have to pray towards a rock that has a black stone in it. That's <laughs> idolatry, okay? Number three, you have to give charity only to Muslim causes. You are not to su uh, support other causes, but yet you claim Islam is a religion of peace and mercy, okay? That's a joke right there. And then you have fasting when people really, all they do is if they cannot fast during the month, you pay somebody to fast on your behalf and you earn righteousness based on what you have done. Yet you deny what Jesus have done for you on the cross by getting his righteousness. And then you go and perform the pilgrimage. That's the fifth uh, pillar. And you've heard what happens to women in the holiest of places. Does that answer your question about the basics? I hope so. Okay, uh, dear sister, well, thank you so much. We can have you for at least, uh, you know, another hour. I mean, I can see everybody's <laughs> excitement here, but uh, obviously want to be respectful to your time and everybody's time. So with that says, we want to extend an invitation to you to hopefully join us again to talk about practical ways uh, you've been exposed to when people were witnessing to you and now things that you are also dealing with when reaching Muslims for Christ. But we'll leave that decision up to you. You pray about it and let us know whenever you feel comfortable doing so. Thank you again for everyone. You guys have done an amazing job. I have a lot of beautiful and wonderful volunteers that always, uh, you know, uh, team up with us during these live uh, streams. And we want to thank them for that. We want to remind everybody to pray for our dear sister. Uh, you've heard it already. Living in the UK or outside the UK makes no difference sometimes, especially for someone who's a female who comes from an Islamic background. And remember to pray for all of us in our ministries, of course. And if you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, this will be on that YouTube channel. We encourage you to subscribe to Sira International and you'll be able to receive notifications in the future of such amazing interviews that we are privileged to really be connected with people like our dear sister Khadija. Final words, dear sister. Just thank you and bless everyone who's, who's watching and please, even the Muslims that are watching, my intention was never to uh, upset you. It really, it really wasn't. I bring you a message of hope I bring you a message of salvation and I would ask that you you sincerely ask the true God to reveal himself to you and I pray that the light of Jesus Christ will shine upon you as it shined upon me because ultimately there is only one God and I know that God is Christ. Amen. Amen. With that said, thank you so much. Lord bless you and Lord bless you everybody. Take care and we'll see you soon next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.